the following that um, on this front screen sometime this week I will have the schedule of SI sessions where and when and what days uh, so hopefully that'll be helpful to you we'll be putting them in web courses usually there's a Facebook page for SI you know so several different channels for you to stay abreast of what's happening what the schedule is on any given day and the more you can go to SI the better it's definitely helpful all right now last time we were talking about this idea of how do you predict the future state of a physical system for instance if you're looking at a chemical reaction you know how do you predict the progress of that chemical reaction over the course of a minute over the course of a year if it's a really slow chemical reactions and there are chemical reactions that take a year to proceed they're very slow and you got to let them cook in physics you know what we've been doing here the very very basic uh, activity of a skateboarder skating down the aisle very simple just rolling straight ahead um, how do you predict his position with accuracy? In other words, uh, more than just a scientific guess, a scientific prediction within the limit of your ability to measure, but still better than a guess. How do you do that? Well, um, let's talk about you know, how Galileo would have done it. Galileo is our physics professor. I'm his student you're his student and Sir Isaac Newton was his student think about that Sir Isaac Newton like the second or third smartest guy of all time he was a student at Galileo so now the things that you need to know in order to predict the future state for instance the motion of an object like an apple falling out of an apple tree right before it conks Sir Isaac Newton on the head which supposedly happened first you have to know the initial position in other words at time t equals zero Caitlin what are the x y and z coordinates now for Caitlin back there uh, on uh, Tuesday last week we set the origin of the coordinates back there by where Caitlin was sitting and then we extended the x-axis down the aisle so it's kind of a tilted x-axis but it's fine it's good we just needed one axis the skateboarders Colin and uh, who's the other guy Steven Steven where are you at okay Steven did you, you were over there last time no you're over here no, okay right. anyways Colin and Steven you know, they're just kind of sliding down the aisle. And my morning class, you know, we had two other guys, Jacob and uh, Jacob and the other guy sliding down the aisle. And this was the x-axis. Now, if we were doing an experiment up here on the stage, you know, I might have left to right being the x-axis. So left to right from from my so that's the positive x-axis over here to your right and this is the negative x-axis and then for instance the y-axis might go straight up from where I'm sitting okay and then the negative y-axis would be below the stage and then the z-axis would be going straight up towards Caitlin back there and about about the same level Caitlin and I are about the same level we see eye to eye on that okay uh, so that that so you whatever you're doing, you set up your coordinate system, figure out how you're going to measure. You know, in meters, inches, millimeters, light years, if you're an astronomer, and then you make your measurements of initial position. So, for instance, for what we did, uh, we oriented everything to Caitlin in the back, right? The the person with the same job in the morning section, his name was Tyler. Right. Now, initial velocity is what you also need to know. You don't have to know everything in the universe. You just need to know initial position and initial velocity. 
So at time t equals 0, do you know vx, vy, and vz? Now vx, that notation means the component of the velocity in the x direction. In our experiment with the skateboarders, this was the only component of the motion because we set it so that the x axis was straight down the aisle. Now a baseball heading for the outfield if you set the x and y coordinates um, centered at home plate and the z axis going from home plate straight through the pitcher's mound and the x axis going left and right from home plate and the y axis going straight vertical from home plate then if you hit a baseball towards the outfield or anywhere, it's going to have a little bit of motion in all three of those uh, dimensions. So Vx, Vy, and Vz. So in general, you need three uh, components, three numbers, you know, 20 meters per second in, uh, in the x direction, and one meter per second in the y direction, and 20 meters per second in the z direction. So if you had that, in our coordinate system, that would mean a uh, line drive to uh, right field. Okay, a pretty good, a pretty hard line drive to right field. Okay, so that's what you need to know. Now, the third thing that you need to know is some formula by which you can evolve from the initial conditions, initial position, initial velocity to a later position and a later velocity. And those equations, sometimes plural, for free fall it's usually just one equation, but for complicated systems, you know, like a black hole uh, during the Big Bang, you know, you might have a, z a, a whole bunch of equations of evolution, or sometimes we call them the equations of motion plural, possibly. For us, we're going to have one equation of motion that will tell us everything we need. And that is actually the object of today's lecture. We're going to figure out for a simply accelerating system like the skateboarder, like a free fall, apple falling from the apple tree, we're going to figure out the equation of motion for that. And then we're going to figure out fancier stuff in the days and weeks to come. But for today, that's our main objective. All right. Now, I have a couple comments about notation. Sometimes uh, we can express a vector with a symbol. A lot, the, the position vector is frequently expressed with the lowercase r and a little teeny arrow over it. And then that symbolizes the x, y, and z coordinates of the position. So position is a vector. Velocity is also a vector. And the common customary symbol for that is a v with a little arrow over the top of it. And that represents the three speed numbers. The speed along the x-axis, vx. The speed along the y-axis, vy and the speed along the z-axis, vz. All right, now another variation, um, instead of the using the little teeny arrow over the top, sometimes you read um, a book or a keynote file like what you've got here, uh, and instead of using a little arrow, they make the symbol boldface. Okay, so in this case, um, speed v, speed is just the number. Okay, that's like your speedometer rating. It doesn't have, speed does not have a direction. But velocity does imply that you have a direction. And instead of putting a little teeny arrow like this, sometimes a textbook will use a bold face. Now, this is a bold face Arial V. And the one right above here is a regular face Arial V. Okay, so they're kind of hard to tell apart. So sometimes I use this second bold face. This is Rockwell Extra Bold. 
my font. And so sometimes you'll see me do that. So sometimes I'll use a little arrow. Sometimes I'll use boldface. If I'm on the document cam, I'll usually use uh, chalkboard boldface. And I'll show you how that works sometime next time we're on the document cam. It's pretty normal. Anyway, so vectors and vector notation, uh, this kind of just something to be aware of. All right, you might see me use it from time to time. Now, a couple more things about position vectors. Okay. Now, if you're, if you had pan, I had waffles for breakfast, but this little kitty cat had pancakes for breakfast. But notice that little kitty cat, he's not looking at his plate. He's looking at, it, at his master's plate. He's looking at those big pancakes. I thought that was up on Reddit yesterday. I thought it was funny. So position is a, a vector. Distance is a scalar. Distance is a simple number. It's computed by using two different position vectors, and you use the Pythagorean theorem, you know, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and then you hit the square root key, and that gives you the distance. Um, and that's just a regular number. So 55 meters distance um, tells you, you know, how far it is from point A to point B, but it doesn't really, just knowing the distance doesn't tell you actually where the two points are, just how far apart they are. And sometimes that's all you need to know, like for gravitation. The, Newton's law of universal gravitation is based on distance, uh, not a vector of position. Velocity is also a vector, but speed is a scalar. And a colloquial way to think of speed is just whatever's on your speedometer. When you're cruising down the road, you know, you're looking at your speedometer, you're trying to avoid getting a ticket, you know, because they can, they can run hundreds of dollars. You know, you keep your out on the speedometer, and that's just a number. You, in other words, you could be driving 65 miles an hour in any direction, right? And if you're a robot and not looking out the window, or if you're a human on a big parking lot driving around in a circle, at, now that would be a pretty big circle to drive around a circle at 65. But I guess a regular sized parking lot, if it's clear, you could drive around at 15 miles an hour easy. But so if you're, if you're a, you know, in, driving around on a circle, or if you're a robot that doesn't have eyes, you're just going off GPS, you know, you don't, you don't know where you're going, or if you're on a circle, you're going in all directions at any one time, um, but the speed is the same. You know, 15 miles an hour out in the parking lot, 65 miles an hour for some robot driving from here to, to Miami on the turnpike. You know, but the direction, it, you know, is sep it's a separate issue. Now, you want to know that, but it's not the same as the speed. So you compute, you compute the speed, and to do that, you don't need two positions. You need two positions and two time measurements, and actually two distance measurements and two time measurements. Uh, we'll get you a, a pair of speeds, or we'll get you a speed, all right? Now, last comment on this about vectors and scalars. The direction is necessary for every vector. For us, it's enough to uh, know the, you know, to graph out a vector on graph paper. And if it's going up and to the right, you could say north, northeast. If it's going down to the right like this, you can say no southeast. If it's going straight to the left, you can say west. Straight up, north, that's good enough. But I mean, but if you, if you want to know the exact number of degrees on a compass, then you got to do a little trig. Now, we're not going to do any trig in this class other than Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You know, raise your hand if you've had trig class. That's a fair number of you. Raise your hand if you're an ace at trig. Any eight? What, there's one guy that's a trig ace up here. Well, if you've had trig class, you 
you're in good shape. You know, basically we're going to do, you, you'll probably see a lot of trig that I sneak in without telling it, telling you about it, but a squared plus b squared equals c squared is about it. Anyway, so position vector, distance of scalar, velocity of vector, speed of scalar, and then direction by using trig or the compass. All right, now here's the, our basic task for the day. Uh, how does the skateboarder's state of motion evolve over time? We're going to go back and take a look at Jacob number one from the morning class. Here's some of his data. Now the people in that class, the person at the very back was Tyler. So capital T is Tyler. And event A, that's Austin, A-U-S-T-I-N. If you downloaded the second PDF from morning section uh, over the weekend, uh, you saw that, uh, that Tyler Austin. Here's uh, Jacqueline J. Go ahead and copy this stuff down. You're going to need it for the clicker questions. And then the last person down at the bottom of the row is Maddie. Um, Maddie, do you go by Madeline? Madison, okay. So Maddie's, Maddie Madison was down here in the in the bottom of the aisle at the at, at the end of the aisle, and it was someone named Michaela, M I C H A E L A. And here's Jacob's first run on the skateboard. Times and positions. Make sure you jot these down. I've got delta T and delta X calculated for you. Uh, so from from Tyler to Austin, it's 1.82 seconds of elapsed time, a distance of 3.8, and then delta X from Austin to Jacqueline is 3.5. Matter of fact, it's a 3.58, a little bit different distances than what we had uh, from Maddie to who's uh, Cody to Omari to Darion to Caitlin. So we had a little bit smaller distances. And then I've calculated the average speed for these guys. And you guys had some average speed calculations to do for homework number three. Pretty basic homework, not that. Tonight you're going to have some homework. I'm going to have your homework ready by lunch, excuse me, by supper time tonight hopefully sooner, and it'll be due Thursday at noon, 12.01 p.m. Okay, so copy this down. And just a couple concepts. We know from looking at the average speed that his speed is changing. In other words, it's evolving over time. All right. So we want to figure out an equation of motion for the skateboarder, Jacob number one, or any skateboarder. We're going to do that today. To do that and to kind of make sense out of this, we're going to calculate some delta Vs, the change in the average speed. All right, now there, we're going to do two of them. And get your clicker out and your calculator, because when we do these, we're going to answer clicker questions. First of all, for the change in speed, delta V, between Austin and Jacqueline from A to J. And then we're going to ask another question, and you're going to type in a number for the second one, uh, between Jacqueline and Michaela. All right. So make sure you have all those data in there. And really all you need for the questions are these three average speeds. All right, so let's do that. And make sure you have your calculator out and your clicker. And turn on your clicker. And if, if, you, if you don't get the Go Nitro message, hold the power button down until the square flashes. Then type in the letters BB and you'll be good. All right, now I'm going to move away.
away from this data table. Uh, hopefully you've all got it copied. If not, look at your neighbor. And in class, in general, my wonderful students, it is lovely and appropriate for you to talk to your neighbor and coach your neighbor or kibitz with your neighbor or don't annoy your neighbor, but talk things over with your neighbor and kind of sort things out. If, if they get stumped, you can help them. If you get stumped, maybe they can help you. And do that in class, in regular lecture, that is fine. On exams, of course, you can't do that. But in this class, yeah, so if you're, if you're talking and stuff during a clicker question, especially when we have a calculation, it's perfectly fine. All right, so let me go to the question here. Um, let me start the question. Calculate delta V for Austin, for the interval between Austin and Jacqueline. This little kitty cat. That was another picture on Reddit yesterday. And if you change your mind, if you consult with your neighbor, which I see a bunch of you doing, that's good. If you change your mind, change your answer. Just type in a different letter, and that's fine. It'll it'll just change your answer. You can change your answer 17 times. Now, we're on multiple choice, so all you have to do is click A, B, C, or D, or E. The change in the speed. Okay, 15 seconds. Good. You ready? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. 165, 167 students. Good. All right, now let's see what you guys, oh, brother. Looks like we got a bunch of geniuses in here. Good. Most of you got it. Yeah, it's, it's V2 minus V1. It's always later minus earlier. And in this case, it's the average speed at Jacqueline minus the average speed at Austin, 0 0.7. All right, now we're going to do another question. Let me move this results panel off here. Okay, we're going to do a numeric question. So when you, we switch from multiple choice to numeric, you have to have to hit the blue refresh key. Okay, it's a little blue one on the right side, excuse me, on the left side of your clicker. Okay, so hit that, and it'll be ready again. And let me start the question. And now I want you to type in a numeric answer. And if your number is between 0 and 1, type 0 point something. All right? And I want two dis decimal points to the nearest 0 0.01 meter per second of speed. Okay. And the way you do it, you know, you, sh you should be good here. You hit the, hit the refresh button, and then it, it starts you at the number 1. And then if you hit the down arrow key, you'll go to 0. And I think below that is the decimal point. No, then you keep going to 9. So, so you hit the up and down arrow keys to select a number. Then you hit the right arrow key to choose the next number. So you're going to be choosing 
a number, the decimal point, and then two more numbers. And then when you're done, hit the send button. Because, Darion, because if you don't hit the send button, it's, it's still listening. And it doesn't know when you've stopped typing, so you got to hit send. Question? What's that? You hit the up and down arrow keys. It's kind of like an old-time cell phone. You see him? Yo. Yo. Did you see it? Okay. And the decimal points in there, too, it's just really hard to see. Really hard. It's annoyingly hard. Aggravatingly hard. It's discombobulatingly hard. Bodaciously hard. Anyways, in a, in a word, it's a pain in the neck. Especially when the light's not good. Well, I'll take that as a compliment. I can't even see this without my glasses. My glasses are all mangled up. Got to get new glasses, man. Okay, 15 seconds to get your answer in. All right. Let me see what you guys voted for. Sweet. 78% uh, of you got this answer. Now, I want to point something out to you. We're going to be using numerical answers from time to time. And if you look at this results uh, scoreboard here, you can see the top answer is in green. That's the correct answer. Um, and you can see other, you know, like six people chose uh, 1.12, right? That's wrong. Uh, and I can actually look at – see, now here's somebody 0.52. Uh, one person. Now, and I can just go down the list here. I deliberately typed in a wrong answer to see if I could get on the board here. Zero point three four, zero point five two. Anyway, uh, actually, I think this is me. Seven point nine two. I want to point something out to you to that's important on exams. We're going to be using clickers in exams to type in numeric answers, just like this. And you'll have it on your test paper. You won't be running from the computer display. You'll be going from you know your test handout, and then you'll click it in on your own pace. It works a little differently from in class, but it, it works pretty good. The nice thing is this table shows you all the – my software records all the values that you click in. So for every NID of every person that's in here, there'll be a number. It saves it in a spreadsheet. And I can open the spreadsheet and easily look at all the answers. And if I see somebody that's got like a 5.3 or a 0.52, I can have mercy on them and give them partial credit. 
and on the exam the calculation type questions or any kind of a uh, multi-part question will be two points or even three points and when that's the case I can give full points if you get it correct or if you get it partially correct you know like you blew a decimal point or something obviously uh, I give you one point out of two or one point out of three or two points out of three depending on the problem so it's really really nice and this software um, is pretty nice for that all right now I've got something I want to bring up here's the Delta V for uh, let me get my cursor over here Austin to Jacqueline 0 0.70 Jacqueline down to Michaela 0 0.53 uh, they are not the same and so it's it's a little bit, you know, because of the, they have the same distance, 3.58 meters apart. So there's a problem here. Distance-wise, these delta Vs equal distances, but the delta Vs are not the same. And if you do the similar calculations for all of uh, the other runs in this class and all of the runs in the morning class, uh, you'll see the delta V's distance wise they do not you know they're not comprehensible so but but it's it's a we think it's a smooth acceleration in other words it's not jumpy he just came those guys just came smooth and nice all the way down now we have to go by what the numbers say we can't make stuff up but if your impression is that it's smooth and not jumpy and if your distance doesn't correlate smoothly like this, then maybe there's something else that will make it seem coherent. And that's what we're going to do with the next few questions. Hit your refresh key. And let's take a look at the problem. Here's the problem. The speeds that you used were average speeds. And the average speed does not necessarily occur uh, when the skateboarder passes the observer. So in other words, what I'm telling you is that the skateboarder Jacob passed uh, Austin at time t equals 1.82 seconds. But 1.97 was not his speed at that instant of time. His instantaneous speed, the, the, in other words, his actual speed, if he had a speedometer on his skateboard, it would not have been 1.97. Now, for the entire interval, distance divided by time, yeah, that's an average speed. But, you know, the jackrabbit, the, the, the hare, in the story of the tortoise and the hare, you know, the tortoise goes at a nice even speed and wins the race. And the hare has a ch wildly changing speed. And so his average speed is way less than the tortoise. And he loses the race. But, he, you know, an instantaneous speed at some instant of time might have been really, really fast. Now, there's a nice discussion of that in the text. Right? The tortoise and the hare. I've got all kinds of tables in there for you to, to look over. But this is our basic problem. The speed is changing, but the actual instantaneous speed is not the same as the average speed uh, when the skateboarder passes the observer. And that's what we've got in the second column. This is the time right here that the skateboarder passes the average or passes the observer. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you some clicker questions. These are both going to be multiple choice. So hit your refresh key and you'll be back to multiple choice mode. All right. Or if you turn it back on, it, your clickers will turn off automatically after like two minutes or something, I think. Turn it back on. You'll be in back in in mode for for this question. Where's my cursor? Here we go. Okay, now we're going to assume in italics a smoothly accelerating skateboarder, and that we're taking his speed at these two times one second and three seconds 
with a radar gun so we have really precise speeds at those two instants. What's the average speed? Go ahead and make a decision. Average speed. And go ahead and jot down this information. T equals 1. V equals 4.0 meters per second. T equals 3 seconds. Instantaneous speed. V equals 8.00 meters per second. Because we're going to need that for the next question. And we're actually going to talk about that. What is the average speed? So in other words, at the at the so if he passes Austin at time t equals 1.0 seconds and he passes Jacqueline at time t equals 3.00 seconds He's actually got two different speeds than whatever the average speed would be. But you can figure out an average speed here. 15 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys got. Uh-oh. We got a little bit of controversy. That's good. You know what this tells me? It tells me we got to talk it over. So let's talk it over. Um, how do you figure out that the average speed is 6.0 meters per second? The way that you do that is by adding them up and divide by 2. That's pretty simple. Add them up and divide by 2. If you have two measurements, add them up and divide by 2. If you have three measurements, it's a little trickier, but in this case, add them up and divide by 2. And that's how you get 6.0. Now, the next question on the eye clicker follows on this one. So make note, average speed is 6.00 meters per second. Next question, here's a graph. This is a graph of speed on the vertical axis versus time on the horizontal axis. Same data, different question. At what time? So where on the horizontal axis does his actual speed equal, because that graph is his actual speed. He's accelerating smoothly from 4 up to 8. Equal increments of speed for every equal increment of time. So every thousandth of a second, he gathers another amount of speed. Every thousandth of a second, he gets the same amount of speed until he's up to 3.0 seconds and has attained 8.00 meters per second of speed. So what is your time? 15 seconds to decide. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. OK, let's see what you guys voted for. I don't know. You guys are geniuses today. That's good. Yeah, that's the time. And what I suggest that you do uh, for this is add a little star or something uh, over here. Right, just to signify this is the time, the special time, 
when the instantaneous speed is actually the same value as the average speed. And the reason that that's important, add that in there, is that in general the instantaneous speed will equal the average at the halfway time. Okay, if you're, and that's if you're accelerating smoothly. Now, if you're herky jerky like the, the hare in the tortoise and the hare fable, no. But if you're smoothly, you know, nothing but net, smoothing, smoothly accelerating, yeah, halfway time. Now, that's important for us as we work out some of the implications. And notice that the more time you have, the more speed you have. So they're proportional. And that gives us our equation of motion. The equation of motion for a smoothly accelerating object, like a skateboarder or like an apple falling out of an apple tree, is simply delta V, the change in speed, is equal to some number A, the acceleration, times how much time it's fallen, delta T. The more time, the more speed. The symbol A is known as the acceleration, or that's the symbol for acceleration. And if the object is accelerating smoothly, as it looked like to us on the skateboard coming down the aisle, then this is the equation of motion. This is the evolution equation for that system. All right, now, I want to give you another equation that comes out of this. And to do that, we have to think about the speed versus time graph again. All right, so let's check out the speed versus time graph. Um, and let's do the most basic of all. Speed versus time um, for somebody at constant speed. So here's speed versus time for somebody that's just going along at one meters per second. All right, so that's like two miles an hour, two point something miles an hour. So it's just kind of, you know, it's they're they're just kind of strolling. All right, and they're going and plus means so the top half of this graph means forward, they're moving forward, and the bottom half means if they were down there, we'd put them down there if they were moving backwards. You know, so if you're backing up, you know, at one meter per second, you'd be down here. But let's, let's just work with this guy. He's kind of chugging along at one meters per second. A walk in the park, literally. All right. Now let's, let's follow him for two and a half seconds. All right, so that means your dotted line, your dotted line is the graph, all right? The dotted line is the graph, and that is the graph of the speed versus time. From time t equals 0 here to time t equals 2.5 seconds out here, all right? I want you to shade, draw in a vertical line on either side. Well, you already have one. Uh, on the left side, the, the V axis is already there, but on the right side, over here, draw a, dot, a line and just shade in that, make a rectangle and kind of shade it in. And I've made mine kind of greenish blue. All right. And what I would like you to consider now is we have a rectangle and we can compute its area. The area is equal to base times height. And hopefully you remember that from geometry class. Base time, you know, base time height for a rectangle. In this case, however, it's not an x versus y graph, it's a time and speed graph. So it's an abstract graph. But we can still calculate the area. The base is still 2.5 seconds. It's, it has a base. It's just not measured in meters. It's measured in seconds. 
all right, that's fine. Astronomers measure things in, in basically in years and seconds, light sec. Did you know that it's 500 light seconds of distance from Earth to the sun? It takes light about 500 seconds, 499 point something seconds to get from the surface of the sun to us. And then the height of this is one meter per second. You know, it's, you know, from the t-axis up to the graph itself, it's one meter per. So that's not meters, it's not centimeters, it's not inches, it's a speed value. So that's, but we can still multiply those two together. But before you multiply them together, there's something you better do first, and that is, you better cancel. All right, so cancel there and there. Cancel the seconds from the numerator in the first parentheses and cancel from the, the denominator of the second parentheses. All right, and so that means that all you have left for units of measurement is meters. And that means, my wonderful students, that the area under this graph, between the graph and the t-axis, that area is interpreted as the distance. Because if you're going two and a half seconds at one meter per second, how far are you going? 2.5 meters. It's pretty simple. And so you can always make that interpretation. Raise your hand if you've had calculus class. See a bunch of you. Integration. You see it? Area under the graph. Now we'll do a velocity graph for something that's slowing down. Now go ahead and sketch this series of dots here. A to B is a big distance. B to C is a little bit smaller. C to D is even smaller, and D to E is the smallest of the four. Now this, this is a series of dots to represent kind of artificially um, a strobe photo of something that's slowing down. Now if you've ever seen a strobe photo, it'll freeze the motion of something, you know, every time the strobe light flashes okay and so you can see it's it, you can see like the the motion of a hummingbird's wing or a dragonfly's wings in a stroke photo it'll catch them all and it, you see a ser all in one photo versus a motion picture which is taking a series of individual photos and then they run them through, and to you it looks like continuous motion. But a strobe photo is a photo of motion all crammed into one image. So this is like an artificial strobe photo of a red dot that's slowing down. It's really motating from A to B. And it's starting to slow down. B to C, it's, it doesn't quite cover. You know, because a strobe, it's every, you know, every hundredth of a second or every tenth of a second, or, you know, every one second, depending on what you want to do, you know, what's your timing. And you can set it to be whatever you want. Okay, so it's really, it's really buzzing through in the first time interval, but then by the, the last time interval from D to E, the fourth time interval, it's just kind of poking along. It's just, you know, it just, you know, goes a little bit. All right, so this is slowing down. And this is what a strobe photograph would look, look like. Now, a velocity graph would look like this. Okay? Let's say that he's going fast at time t equals 0. So he's up here at time t equals 0, and he slows down to 0 after 4 seconds, for instance. All right? So here's your graph. A straight, this is somebody that's, smoothly slowing down. They're not speeding up like the skateboarder. They're smoothly slowing down. All right? So they're going from 3 meters per second, which is about 6 point something miles per hour, to zero in about 4 seconds. 
smoothly and uniformly. All right? We can make the distance interpretation again. The shaded in part of the graph, the blue kind of swirly area, uh, between the dotted line graph and the t-axis, that is that area is interpreted as the distance that this object moves during this time interval from 0 to 4 seconds. Right? So now, we don't use base times height for a triangle. We use 1 half base times height. Remember that from geometry class? It's basically a rectangle, and then you cut it in half. Diagonally, you get a rectangle, or you get a triangle. All right. So one half base times height, and we have a base of four seconds, and the height of this particular triangle is three meters per second. And this is just an example. I could have made it anything I want. We're going to do a a free fall example here in a minute, which is going to have different times and stuff. But this is a, you know this is a good example. Now, I'm going to do, so this is it. There, there's your distance. You can calculate it from that. 4 times 3 is 12. One half of that is 6. So the total distance is 6 meters. But, I, but before we, you know, go to that, I want to show you something that you could do if you wanted to. And what you could do if you wanted to is take this factor of 1 half here and change it into a 2 in the denominator underneath the speed, underneath the, that height quantity. So 3 meters per second divided by 2. That's the same number, isn't it? Well, that'll be our distance. You know, and the seconds cancel again. And we could definitely do this. I mean, we don't have to. But, yeah, you can do it. And if you do it, there's something interesting about that particular fraction, that particular quotient. What are we looking at there? What is that? Does it have a name? Think. Raise your hand if you feel bold to suggest an interpretation for that quotient. I'm looking through the classroom. My eyes are moving student to student, inch by inch. Do you have a theory back there? I see you about ready to raise your hand. You don't want to raise your hand? With the glasses by the wall. No, not him. No, there's nobody next to you over there. Don't look at the wall. Yeah, did you? He's sitting over by the wall. And he goes like this, like, there, like there's somebody sitting next. Would well, you have an invisible companion over there? Maybe we better not talk about that. Anyways, did you have an idea? No. You, what's that? Trig. Oh boy, you're overshooting the target quite a bit. I, you know, because that factor too, the denominator definitely is it all over the place in trig. I'm not saying you're wrong, but it's not. That's not the answer to this question. Uh, numerator is a speed. It's the average speed. That's what that is. So this is really delta t times the average speed. Kind of cool. And really, that shouldn't be surprising, you know, because the average speed is equal to the distance traveled divided by the time elapsed, and that's basically what we have here, except we, you know, it's, you multiply both sides by delta t, and you get this equation. So there's no great shakes about this. But now I'm going to add one more wrinkle to this. 
the average speed or the the numerator 3 meters per second is the amount of speed that the, in this case he's lost all right so three so make a note off to the side 3 meters per second is delta v delta v the amount of speed that he's lost is acceleration times delta t equation of motion you know that equation of motion delta v equals a delta t we had just a few minutes ago so that's really what we've got here in the numerator that's a delta t so average speed is a delta t over two all right the amount of speed that you lose or in this case or if you're speeding up the amount of speed that you gain divide that by two and that'll be your average speed you know because you go from zero to you know 17 so your average would be you know in half or whatever you know whatever your average speed happens to be this out how it works out now that being the case let me move this up now all right so your, your distance triangle here is delta T base times average speed. Okay, that's good. Um, and average speed is A delta T over 2. So really the distance is delta T, the base, times A delta T over 2. And hey, you guys, there's two factors of delta T in here. So really that's delta T quantity squared. Nice. And so the general formula, da 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 da, in an accelerated system, if you if you lose all your speed, or if you start from zero and gain speed, the distance you travel is one half a t squared, whatever your acceleration happens to be. Okay. Now the acceleration in this particular case is uh, 0 0.5 meters per second per second of travel. It's 3 divided by 4, delta V over delta T. Anyways, this is the distance. Uh, students in calculus, what do you see? You see an integral? 1 half x squared, remember that? Integral of x dx? Very similar. Now, Here's your general result for a distance triangle. And what we're going to do now is adapt this for the last four or five minutes of class. Hopefully we'll dismiss a little early today, if you're up for it. Okay, finally you smiled. You've been, you've been you're looking like this all day. Finally you smiled. Okay. So we're going to dismiss early, hopefully, and you won't have to look at the wall. <laughs> That's a classic move, man. That goes in my Hall of Fame. You know, one of the nice things about being a teacher, I love being a teacher. I, I like students, you know. You see some of the funniest things just like, <laughs> like that. Of course, you guys have a lot of tales to tell about us faculty as well, so. But it, I, you know, I don't say it to, to make fun of you. I say it to enjoy you. Anyways, here's our distance triangle. Now, let's do something that's falling. All right. Now, this is the drop dis. This is what I call the drop distance formula. The acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second of speed gained on the way down for every second of free fall. Let me repeat that and you can jot it in your notes. The acceleration due to gravity if you're going downward is 9.8 meters per second of extra downward speed for every second that you're in free fall. So if you're only in free fall for half a second you only get 4.9. But if you're in uh, of extra downward speed. But if you're in free fall for a full second, you're going to get another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Right now, downward for us 
is going to be negatory. So we're going to be actually down on this bottom half of the graph. Question in the back. I can barely hear you. It is not a random number. That is the same acceleration due to gravity. Good question. Um, everywhere on the earth from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Now, gravity does diminish as you go away from the earth. So Mount Everest, theoretically, it's a little bit weaker. Mariana's Trench is a little bit different. But if you go up to the space shuttle, you know, orbit up there with the space shuttle, the space station, um, G is not 9.8 up there. It's a little bit smaller. And the further away you go from Earth, the, the, the weaker the acceleration is. But at, if you're on Earth, anywhere on Earth, 9.8 is, is what we go with. And you can make, but, but here's the other thing. Now, what's your name again? Dante. 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 One of the things that we can do and scientists do worldwide they measure very small variations away from 9.8, you know, like 9.803 versus 9.804, you know. And on one side of a mountain, you might have 9.803. On the other side, you might have 9.804. And that means you've got some, some rocks on that side of the mountain that may be filled with gold or uranium or something. So they use it for pro prospecting, all kinds of things. But, but generally, 9.8 is good for government work. All right, now we're going to use a different um, time scale and a different distance scale here, or velocity scale. Okay, we're going to go two seconds of free fall. And the, the colloquial way to think about this is go to the top of the library with a water balloon and then wait for your best friend to walk by beneath you and have the water balloon ready to drop. Okay, and it's going to take, you got to time it, because if he's walking, it has to intersect with his, you know, coconut, hopefully, at the time, you know, the water balloon has to, you know, uh, you don't want to miss. Okay, so you have to time it right. So how much time does it take? Well, you have to know this formula. All right, so let's look at it. Let's look at speed versus time. You st you're holding it ready to drop. V is equal to zero. So the first point is right here. After one second of drop, you've got 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Now, downward in this case means negative, all right? Or negative means downward, all right? So here's your next point right here, all right? Now, gravity is pretty smooth on the surface. It's 9.8, whether you're up at Mount Everest or down at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. So it's 9.8 all the way. And after two seconds, you're going to have another 9.8 total of negative 19.6. So that puts you down here. Now, here's your graph. Let's put that in. Connect those three dots. Da, 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 da. And now the area between Omari, between that graph and the t-axis is above the graph. So shade that in. All right. And we'll compute that area. Well, that's what this formula does. GT is delta T, 19.6 meters per second for two seconds of free fall. One half times two seconds and you get your distance. So, so that all works out. All right, so let's do this mentally. Let's see, t two squared. Uh, better get, break out your calculator. See, I'm gonna do it mentally, see if you can verify me. Let's see, two squared is four. Four times 9.8 is 36 plus 3.2, 39.2. Okay, so 39.2 times 1 half is 19.6. So this is, is this 19.6 meters. 
That's about the that's about the distance to the top of the 60 feet or so, 60 something feet. I don't know. You could probably measure it, or ask the library. Librarians know everything. You could ask the librarian; they might know. Anyway, so that's a normal drop time for the library. Now, homework four, which will be ready by supper time, if not sooner, will have a few drop distance and other kind of questions in there. It will be due 12.01 p.m. on Thursday. You're dismissed. Great class today.